The Biden campaign is coming out swinging, pushing back to quiet the noise. But the next several days could be critical. After his debate performance in Atlanta just nine days ago, a defiant President Biden sat down for his first exclusive interview since his face-off with Donald Trump. And on the campaign trail, he's made it clear he is not stepping aside and plans to win the 2024 election. Well, let me say this as clearly as I can. I'm staying in the race. Yeah. I'll beat Donald Trump. And despite that strong statement from Biden, the pressure campaign within his own party to get him to step aside seems to be gaining some steam. Congresswoman Angie Craig of Minnesota is now the fifth House Democrat to call on President Biden to leave the race, saying it's time for, quote, a new generation of leaders. Tomorrow, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries will lead a virtual meeting with Democratic committee ranking members, with the focal point being concerns over Biden's electability. Meanwhile, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia is currently working to organize a group of Democratic senators to discuss a path forward. Nevertheless, Biden remains steadfast in his belief that he is, once again, the right candidate to defeat the twice-impeached, quadruple-indicted, convicted for 34 felonies ex-president. Here's what he had to say yesterday in that exclusive interview with ABC News anchor George Stephanopoulos. If you convince yourself that only you can defeat him, I convinced myself of two things. I'm the most qualified person to beat him, and I know how to get things done. If you can be convinced that you cannot defeat Donald Trump, will you stand down? With the friends of, and with the Lord Almighty comes out and tells me that, I might do that. Joining me now is Congresswoman Nakima Williams of Georgia. She's also the chair of the Georgia Democratic Party. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate your time. First, I wanted to get your reaction to President Biden's interview last night on ABC and his response to all the criticism and the speculation surrounding his ability to win this November. So, Katie, what I heard in the interview was the president who has a record to run on. President Biden went before the American people in the sit down interview and he defended his record and he talked about the transformational policies that have been, been enacted over the past three and a half years. I am here at the Essence Festival in New Orleans with thousands of black women from across the country. And you know what I'm hearing, Katie? They appreciate the $16 billion that have been invested in HBCUs over the past three and a half years. They appreciate that black businesses have grown exponentially over the past three and a half years. And then we have an alternative. We have someone else on the ballot, twice impeached, 34 felony convictions, who has bragged about overturning Roe v. Wade. So, Katie, it is clear to me before the debate, after the debate, during the debate, and after the interview, that our choice and our work is clear here. We must defeat Donald Trump in November. I am keeping my eyes on the prize. That is the goal, and that's what we're going to do. Biden or bust. So as I mentioned, though, at the beginning, some Democratic lawmakers have called on President Biden to step aside, but you are a congresswoman. Tell me, what are you hearing from your colleagues? I mean, what I'm hearing is ultimately everyone wants the same thing, Katie. We know that we have to defeat Donald Trump. And no one has a crystal ball to determine what is going to happen in an hour, let alone in November. And so I, what I do know is that voters understand when policies impact their everyday lives. And President Biden has in implemented transformational policies across this country, not for Democratic voters, not for Republican voters, but for everyone in this country. And that's what voters care about most. So my colleagues, they're hearing from people, I'm hearing from people, but at the end of the day, we have a snapshot from polls that have come out in the last nine days, but we also know that voters have the final say. I represent a deep blue district in a periwinkle state. I fully understand that every vote counts. We have to take our story to the voters because ultimately that's who has the final say, the American voters. I want to play for you a clip of Senator John Fetterman on MSNBC last night. Take a quick listen. Donald Trump is back here. And you know what do Democrats do? We panic and piss our pants, you know, after a bad debate. And after 34 uh, convictions, felonies, uh, the Republicans show up and they dress like him and they go all in on Trump. You know, maybe we could learn something here and just, hey, like, stand by our president through this. 
You know, Congresswoman, I've been saying this for a while now. Maybe it's time for the Democrats to take a page out of the GOP playbook. They've circled the wagons around the 34 felony convicted, twice impeached, quadruple indicted, liable for sexual abuse nominee. Why are Democrats, though, focusing on only one debate performance instead of you know, really amplifying the successes of that first administration for Joe Biden and to see and to emphasize the importance on Donald Trump, who is such an existential threat to American democracy. So, Katie, this has become the media narrative for the past nine days, and that's what people are responding to. And we all saw the debate. So I am not going to pretend that we had a great night on last Thursday. But what I know is that we have three and a half years of progress that we need to continue to build upon. And the only way to do that is to elect President Joe Biden and send him a Democratic Congress so that we can finish the job. We need to codify Roe v. Wade so that our freedoms are protected. It. We need to get the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act passed so that we can protect the right to vote for people all over this country. And there is only one way to do that, and that is to make sure that we defeat Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a threat and a danger to our democracy, and so we must remain committed and clear. Some of my colleagues are moving in a different direction, but ultimately our goals are the same, defeating Donald Trump. I am in a battleground state. We understand that Every vote counts. We're build, building multiracial coalitions, talking to all voters about the issues that matter to them. We only won Georgia by 11,780 votes, those votes that Donald Trump tried to get from our secretary of state when he wanted to overturn the will of the voters and overturn the 2020 election results. But the voters have the final say, Katie, and that's what will happen this November. I'm glad you brought up those 11,780 votes because that's exactly, oh, I don't know, maybe Donald Trump got indicted for that in the state of Georgia for trying to overturn the elections of a 2020, uh, a lawful 2020 presidential election. I wanted to note for our viewers, you are kindly taking time out of your schedule. You are at Essence Festival right now. Vice President Kamala Harris about to speak there in just a few minutes. What are you expecting to hear from our vice president about her role in the campaign during this critical period? period. So, Katie, I just left the vice president when she came in. She had a small clutch with a group of CBC members, and we talked with her. And she is getting ready to go on the stage to have a conversation with the CEO of Essence about what this election means for black women in this country. But how do we build those multiracial coalitions to protect our freedoms? Because our freedoms are on the ballot. This is not about one person at the top of the ticket. I love my president and my vice president, and they've done tremendous work. But at the end of the day, this election is not about a single person. It's not about a personality. It's about the issues that each candidate brings to the table, and it's about protecting our freedoms that are on the ballot. So I am looking forward to her addressing a very rowdy crowd here at Essence. We've been living our best lives, Katie. But today and through November, my Black job is protecting democracy, and that's what we're going to continue to do. I got less than a minute, though, and I wanted to end with this final question. Project 2025, it's the blueprint for the destruction of democracy if Trump wins in November. President Biden said during that interview last night, quote, I think the United States and the world is at an inflection point where the things that happen the next several years are going to determine the next six or seven decades, how they look. How can the urgency of that message get across to voters? Absolutely, Katie. It is scary when you look at some of the things that are in here. But when people show you who they are, Katie, we must believe them the first time, in the words of Maya Angelou. But what we also know is that Donald Trump, whether he tries to distance himself from this Project 25 memo that's been out, we all understand what he said with his own mouth. He cheered and celebrated overturning Roe v. Wade. Our freedoms are on the line in this election cycle. So we must turn out like we've never turned out before to make sure that we protect our freedoms and reelect President Joe Biden so that we can move our country forward, not continue to look backwards as Donald Trump tries to continue to divide our country. We begin with breaking news tonight. While the Biden-Harris campaign is pulling no punches in what promises to be a critical week in the race to the White House, NBC News has confirmed that four more House Democrats have called on President Biden to drop out of the race, bringing the total now to nine. 
This happened just a few hours ago as House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries led a meeting with top congressional Democrats. Joining me now from Capitol Hill is NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, thanks for joining me. What more do we know about this meeting and the four lawmakers who just joined in to ask for President Biden to step aside? Yeah, hey, Katie. Well, look, this was a meeting that lasted nearly two hours. It began at 2 this afternoon. Uh, it was a virtual meeting because, again, lawmakers have not been back to the Capitol since that debate. They're returning actually in person tomorrow, so I assume we will see even more of them joining in person, finally huddling and reconvening with their colleagues to get on the same page or not about what President Biden's future should be as the leader of their party. You see all of those names and faces on your screen. The four additions are very significant because remember, this call that House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries convened uh, actually had the top Democrats on the key committees join the call. So you're talking about guys like Jerry Nadler. This is somebody who is the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee. You're also seeing Adam Smith, the top Democrat on the Armed Services Committee. You're seeing others as well following suit. And we're, we're told, according to our sources, that on the call, uh, those four expressed a lot of concern, specifically with Biden being the top of the ticket. They want to see another nominee. Other sources said that there was overwhelming support, for example, for Vice President Kamala Harris to step into that role with others should Biden step aside. Certainly not all of them calling on him to do so. He was, uh, he did have a large defense, a fierce defense from members of the Congressional Black Caucus that were on the call. We're told uh, Barbara Lee, Maxine Waters, two veteran lawmakers from California, they defended Biden on the call as they have done publicly. We also saw a statement from another member of the Congressional Black Caucus, who was not on the call, Frederica Wilson of Florida, but she criticized some of her fellow Democratic colleagues who are taking this moment to call on Biden to step aside, saying, like many others that I've talked to, that every single minute they talk about the need to replace Biden is a minute wasted that they could be talking about Trump. Also importantly, we heard, uh, according to sources, Susan Wilde, for example, who is the Democratic ranking member on the Ethics Committee, she is a frontline Democrat, a vulnerable Democrat in Pennsylvania. She did not not, according to my sources, call on Biden to step aside, but she expressed significant concern, Katie, with being able to run with Biden at the top of the ticket, with being able to campaign with him and her own reelection prospects. As we learned, of course, Angie Craig, one of the faces on that screen coming out yesterday, also a frontline Democrat, expressing the same concern. So a lot on this call. Bottom line here, this is the first of many that I expect meetings and calls this week. Uh, and unfortunately for Biden, the overall resounding sentiment is is they don't know if they can trust Biden to beat Trump in November, Katie. Julie, we also know Senator Mark Warner has of uh, Virginia maybe will be leading a meeting this week with Democratic senators. What can we expect from that meeting? Yeah, a couple of sources that I spoke to who initially said that they were reached out or their bosses were reached out by uh, from Senator Mark Warner early last week uh, after the debate have told me that they have since not been in contact with Warner. So we don't know exactly what time and when this will happen. There's nothing scheduled concretely yet uh, based on sources that I spoke to. But again, we have reported that Mark Warner, uh, a very high ranking, he is the top Democrat, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee in the Senate. He had his own uh, political ambitions, perhaps even the White House in the future as well. But he is somebody who, we're told, is concerned for the down-ballot effects that Biden's candidacy at the top of the ticket can have on fellow Democrats. For example, his colleague, Tim Kaine, who is running for re-election in Virginia as well. The bottom line here, though, is it doesn't matter if this meeting happens exactly tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow night. Senators are returning to this building as our House members. They will get together. They will talk and huddle to determine uh, whether Biden can lead their party. And certainly this next week is very very crucial. Joining me now is former congressman and co-chair of the Biden-Harris campaign, Cedric Richmond. Congressman, it's good to have you here. First, I'd like to get your immediate reaction to the news of four more House Democrats that are calling for Biden to step aside. Well, thanks for having me. I would <clears throat> reiterate what Congresswoman uh, Frederica Wilson uh, said, and that we shouldn't be spending time talking about that. We should be spending time talking about the threat that Donald Trump po poses. And she urged her colleagues to get their priorities in order. But you also had Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Lisa Blunt, Rochester, all recently come out and show support uh, for the president. So um, while we respect uh, our colleagues, uh, I would just side with 
what Frederica Wilson said. And we need to remind people the threat that Donald Trump poses, not just for four years, but for generations. Uh, Supreme Court is at risk. Women's rights are at risk. Civil rights are at risk. And I would just remind people of that. Yeah, and for our viewers, Congressman, I do want to repeat what Frederica Wilson said, because I agree with you. I think it is important, her messaging. She said, quote, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris defeated Donald Trump in 2020, and they are the Democratic ticket that will do so again this year. Any, quote, leader calling for President Biden to drop out needs to get their priorities straight and stop undermining this incredible actual leader who has delivered real results for our country. I mean, Congressman, you've seen President Biden out on the campaign trail in Pennsylvania today. He's meeting with the voters, the people that actually make the difference in November. Here's what he had to say. Take, take a very quick listen, please. While there are those who want to erase history, Kamala and I want to make it. Because black history is American history. So I tell you what, Dark Brandon's coming back. He's here. And guess what? In the next 120 some days or so, they're going to get a real good look at who Donald Trump is. We're the most powerful country in the world. We have the best economy in the world. But now we got to make sure that we start taking care of the families like Jill and I grew up. I mean, Congressman, he looks good, sounds good, delivering the right messaging. So despite facing these calls to step down, he's out there making his own case on the campaign trail. What's the strategy moving forward then to continue to reassure voters? He's going to continue to uh, be out there. He's going to hold his rallies. He will talk to voters. Uh, and notice it's the chattering class, it's the donor class, it's the elites uh, that you hear um, this distraction from. But what we're going to do is focus on those people who are going to the polls in November, make sure we continue to organize, make sure we continue to talk about the historic accomplishments of the Biden-Harris team. We will continue to organize, we will continue to open field offices, we will continue to do those things that uh, actually make you win an election. And you're going to see him and you're going to see the vice president out there making a case for why, one, they deserve to be reelected, but two, uh, the threat that Donald Trump poses to our democracy. You and other campaign co-chairs were on the call with the president yesterday. What was his message to all of you and for the country? That he's energized. He understands the stakes are high. He understands that the debate was not his best performance. Uh, but also that actions speak louder than words. And so while a debate is all talk, uh, his deeds while he's been in the White House, Katanji Brown Jackson reducing black child poverty by 50 percent, reducing child poverty by 50 percent. Black unemployment is at an all-time low. Black entrepreneurship is at an all-time high. If you look at the economy, if you look at wealth, if you look at all of those indicators, this president has been doing a great job, deserves to be reelected. And then, on the other hand, Donald Trump is talking about a tax break for the top 1 percent in corporations, which I want to remind your voters, uh, your listeners, they pay for. Every time we give a tax break to the top 1 percent in corporations, working families in this country pay for it. President Biden wants to further reduce uh, taxes on those who make under 400000 And so it's a clear contrast of the values of the two men. Uh, President Biden uh, he values working people. Donald Trump has no values, zero values. He is void of values. He is morally bankrupt. And we're going to make that case. And par part of that moral bankruptcy actually tags along with this idea of Project 2025. Conveniently, Trump trying to distance himself from Project 2025, but we know that it was written for, tailor-made for Trump and a second Trump presidency. What's the Biden-Harris campaign doing to amplify the direct line, the direct through line from Project 2025 to Donald Trump? Well, the way we know it's Donald Trump's plan is the fact that he denied it, because when his lips are moving, he's lying. And so it's a plan created for him by those people closest to him. And that plan is extreme, but it's taken out of what he says is his rallies. It would give him almost absolute power. He can go after his enemies. He can take uh, rights of citizens away. He can get rid of civil service and put uh, Trump people all throughout uh, government. It is—he wants to abolish the Department of Education. 
Those things should scare the American voters. We have a responsibility, and we will educate voters on what his extreme agenda is and what Project 2025 means to them. You know, there's been some that have suggested that Vice President Kamala Harris moved to the top of the ticket, and yet she has said publicly, openly, that she supports President Biden. We've also heard other names like Gretchen Whitmer and Gavin Newsom being bandied about. But, Congressman, you and I both know they've also publicly said they support a Biden-Harris ticket. When it comes to specifically, though, Vice President Harris, do you think her campaign role needs to be even bigger during this kind of critical time for Joe Biden? Well, we saw the night of the debate. Uh, I saw her. She was down at the Essence Festival in New Orleans talking to of uh, 30, 40,000 uh, people down there. Uh, she is increasing her role, and she's been a valued partner since uh, day one. Uh, I won't get into whether she's been covered fairly by the press, but she is a mm -hmm. valuable partner. She's incredibly intelligent. And I will just say she has not only publicly stated her support for President Biden, uh, she's privately said that, too. I was with Gavin Newsom after the debate when he did the same, and Gretchen Whitmer was on the chair's call yesterday, and she reiterated her support. Uh, leaders are rallying around this president and vice president because they understand what's at stake and they understand what they have accomplished. When the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. By definition. Exactly. Five decades ago, Richard Nixon's definition of presidential power was just his wishful thinking. But today, Supreme Court has turned it into a reality, giving the next president absolute criminal immunity for so-called official acts. Nixon's crimes during the Watergate scandal, leading to his resignation and eventual part of a Gerald Ford, reminds us of the worst that could happen. For example... Murdering a political rival was not a hypothetical for Richard Nixon, according to our next guest. Former Watergate prosecutor Nick Ackerman writes that Nixon ordered a hit on Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg. Ackerman also points out that one of the reasons Nixon was forced to step down was the release of a recording of him trying to interfere in the FBI's Watergate probe, a clear case of obstruction of justice. But under the new Supreme Court decision, Ackerman writes, quote, there would have been no reason for him to resign. Nixon could have just picked up the phone and directed the FBI to terminate its investigation. Joining me now is former Watergate prosecutor Nick Ackerman. He also served as an assistant United States attorney for the Southern District of New York. Nick, thanks so much for being here. Your new piece, the Supreme Court rewrites Watergate history, 50 years since Nixon's resignation, immunity decision would have undone prosecutions. It's fantastic. I urge everybody to go out and read it. But the thing that's just struck me and, and shook me was the fact that Nixon ordered a hit on Ellsberg, which I was unaware of. But to your point, now, uh, with this SCOTUS decision, you can't inquire into motive, and you certainly can't inquire if it was an official act of Nixon picking up the phone and ordering a hit on a political rival. Same thing could happen now with any president. Of course. I mean, that's the whole problem with this opinion. Um, they. Justice Roberts tries to pawn it off as some kind of fantastic idea that Justice Sotomayor is coming up with talking about a Navy SEAL 6 going out and attacking and assassinating political rivals at the direction of the president. This is not so fantastic and it's not so unusual. This is exactly what Richard Nixon did. Um, and they justices totally ignored this entire history of Watergate in coming up with this crazy opinion that per per permits somebody like Donald Trump, who has already come up with a plan where he says he's going to be dictator from day one, and he's going to suspend the Constitution, and has already violated a number of federal criminal laws. So this is basically opening up the floodgates um, to Donald Trump to do whatever he wants um, and full steam ahead, which is really frightening. Nick, something else that you wrote that really struck me as well was this idea that if a president like Trump gets absolute criminal immunity for his official acts, then by extension, it would make sense that subordinates that are following orders from Donald Trump, for example, to do criminal acts would also not be prosecuted because they're just, quote, following directions, instructions or orders. Nick, we saw that happen with Hitler. We saw right, that happen exactly. in Germany. 
So That's right. what is what is this this theory, I guess, by extension, that subordinates of a president like Donald Trump following his orders, acting criminally, they could not be prosecuted as well? Well, the rationale throughout this opinion is that you can't really get behind the president's motive and what he's doing. And if he's got people, the executive branch, it's the executive branch, the president, that the Supreme Court is focused on. And if, in fact, it's the executive branch and Trump is ordering one of his subordinates to obstruct justice or to carry out a hit or to do whatever might be illegal, and if the president is ordering it and that's an official act and that can't be illegal, then how can you really prosecute somebody who is an arm of the executive branch who's carrying out that order. I mean, it really doesn't make any sense. Where does it stop? I, I just don't and, see how someone wouldn't have that defense. And, you know, Nick, something that, that I was thinking about when I read your piece was the following, which is, when everything was going on with Trump post-November 2020, leading up to January 6, he had to, by necessity, go outside of the DOJ because there were people that actually maintained the guardrails at the Department of Justice to not participate. I mean, I'll, I'll exclude Jeff Clark, the oil spill lawyer. But other than Jeff Clark, there were people that had enough sanity to say, no, this is not going to happen at the DOJ. So he went to the Jeffy, the, the John Eastmans of the world, excuse me, and others, Kenneth Chesbro again. How important is it, somebody like you who knows the historical importance and context of Watergate, now looking at it through the lens of this SCOTUS decision, to make sure that the DOJ has people in, in an administration with a president that have the, the courage and the, and the moral compass to say no and to not actually participate in criminal conduct with the president? It's extremely important. I mean, in fact, this did happen in Watergate. Uh, if you recall, there was a Saturday night massacre. Uh, Elliot Richardson, who was the attorney general, was fired by Nixon. Uh, then the deputy attorney general, Ruckelshaus, was fired. Uh, and that left Robert Bork. And both Richardson and Ruckelshaus prevailed upon Bork to stay in there and not resign and do what Nixon asked, which was to fire Archibald Cox, because they were both afraid, all three of them were afraid, that Nixon would then put one of his cronies in charge of that Department of Justice and all hell would break loose. So that's happened back then. It happened under Trump. And it's going to happen again if Trump gets elected. Unless we don't get Trump in office, but we know that Project 2025, it has an actual chapter on the Department of Justice and the installation of loyalists in the Department of Justice. And so, Nick, it would be a, it would be a disaster of epic proportions if somebody like Trump is back in office with a blueprint like Project 2025 for the DOJ. No question about it. I mean, he's first of all going to get rid of all of the civil servants. I mean, he's basically going to eviscerate the entire civil service at the Department of Justice. Those are the people that are the bulk work of our Justice Department that would stand up to somebody like Trump. But number one plan is to get rid of them. This is a plan that is all being directed by Donald Trump and Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, uh, who has basically set up the same system in Hungary such that it still exists as somewhat of a democratically elected country, except that they've rigged the entire system so that it's gerrymandered and that there is no way that Orban can ever be defeated. And it's the same thing that Donald Trump wants to do to be dictator from day one and suspend our Constitution and do it sub rosa the same way Victor Orban has done it in Hungary. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.